India, land of mystery, is the seventh largest land mass and second most populated nation in the world. in resources and manpower, yet its people are among the poorest and most suffering on earth. Millions of Indians suffer from malnutrition, disease, and poverty. The people are apathetic because their religion has taught them to be detached observers, disregarding the agonizing lifestyle which imprisons them. V.S. Naipaul, himself an Indian, describes India as a wounded civilization paralyzed by her religious beliefs. This complex and contradictory religion known as Hinduism promotes the worship of enlightened godmen called gurus. And countless idols. deifies both nature and femaleness and believes mother goddess to be the original deity. She is worshipped in many forms, as mother India venerated in the shape of her map, as mother earth reverenced in the cow whose urine is even seen as sacred. In goddess Kali, the goddess of death and destruction, who demands to be pacified with blood sacrifices. And in Holy Mother Ganges, the largest river in India. This river is worshipped by millions who flock to her banks to perform daily toiletries and annually dump hundreds of thousands of dead bodies to assure them of a better reincarnation. Its pollution does not dampen the spiritual fervor of the people who believe its waters to be essential for all religious ceremonies and imbued with magical and healing powers. Incredibly, the West is today looking to Hinduism superstitions for hope. The religion that has all but destroyed India has now infiltrated every area of Western society. Protesting that it is not religious but scientific, it is transforming our minds, science, medicine, mass media, politics, and the church. Hinduism is most seductive when it wears the mask of Christian terminology and has shockingly managed to disguise itself as the latest Christian thought. Hundreds of thousands of Western pilgrims have journeyed to India seeking enlightenment and have disappeared by the hundreds. Too often they are destroyed by the madness and perversion of the very gurus they have worshipped and looked to for salvation.
Here in Delhi, India, Guru Darshan Singh, only one of hundreds of gurus, has personally converted or initiated some 15,000 followers. He explains that it is the job of the guru to groom his disciples into the shortest path to salvation. Salvation is the same. But, you know, we have various paths leading to it. You know, some of the paths are long paths, other paths are the short paths. Why is a master then necessary? Master is necessary, you know, to groom you into the shortest path. Descended from a long line of Hindu spiritual masters, Rabindranath Maharaj is a former guru and accomplished yogi who is worshipped by thousands. In his autobiography, Escape into the Light, he tells of his life as a guru and why he abandoned Hinduism. The Hindu needed to be near his guru. The Hindu needed to consult his guru. He eventually saw his guru as the only means to salvation. It is absolutely extraordinary also to look at disciples of some of these gurus that I saw in India, for example. These adoring, huge, open eyes that just will accept mm. anything from him and that just love him beyond anything. I loved Maharishi. I worshipped him. Therefore, everything he said or did or thought was perfectly right in my eyes. I just met Bhagwan and there it was. It's nobody else than him. Bhagwan is my master and I love him. I'm in love with him. That's the only thing I can say. <laughs> Guru Bhagwan Rajneesh, given refuge by the American government after fleeing his native India, has purchased a 100 square mile ranch in central Oregon, to which his red-clad disciples flock from all over the world. Whose astonishing title literally means highest spiritual teacher, lord of the universe, honorable sir and king. Carol Matriciana is a journalist and author of the book, Gods of the New Age. Born and raised in India, she moved to London in 1973, where she became one of England's leading authorities on new religious movements. During the various celebrations in Oregon, Rajneesh comes out in one of his Rolls Royces two or three times a day and is worshipped, literally adored by his thousands of Western followers. It is so saddening to see their devotion for a mere human being who considers himself God and their submission to his spiritual rules, like wearing his picture around their neck continually or wearing various shades of red always or changing their names to Indian ones. His spokeswoman and right-hand lady, Sheila Silverman, tries to explain the attraction and magnetism of her master. He is something, uh, something that is so, I have no words. It is a love relationship, master and disciple. Something happens in your heart when you see a master. <laughs> Bhagwan's my master. Back in India, the proceedings are on a much larger scale. Here at the Kumbh Mela festival or aquarium fair in Allahabad, India, 20 million Hindus gather to witness an endless procession of hundreds of these self-proclaimed godmen.
Even the dirt beneath these gurus' feet is an aid to the disciple in his quest for salvation. This footage was covertly photographed and smuggled out of India. Naked priests are considered to be the holiest and most dedicated of guru disciples. Many cover their bodies with cremation ashes and dirt and mat cow dung into their hair. Some are armed and are dependent upon extremely potent drug concoctions. They have surrendered everything, families, possessions, and even their minds, becoming literally insane out of devotion to their guru. Well, guru is the, our best friend, philosopher, and guide, and he shows the way to God. So, uh, we in our India acknowledge him as a divine power, just equivalent to God. If anyone could be near the beloved master and witness the love, the compassion, the humility, the grace, the generosity, no one in his right mind would not know that this is a walking, talking, living God on earth. In all scriptures you will find that the master is the God incarnated power working on earth. You people that interviewed this gentleman today, I don't think you knew who you interviewed, but you interviewed God. For the Hindu, the guru is all important. The guru is his lord, his master, his savior, even greater than God. Yes, guru is greater than God. The guru concept represents within Hinduism the personal dimension which God represents within Christianity. I have personally talked with many, many gurus, and the sad fact is that within their belief system, they have to be detached and removed from their emotions and compassion. And their cruelty and inhumaneness is seen as spiritual and excused as holy. I was really interested in their worship and their veneration and their adoration and the gifts and offerings they brought to me. But I was certainly not interested in their problems and their difficulties and hardships and pains. The Guru followers believe that he returns this incredible love that they feel towards him. But in reality, he feeds off their emotions to maintain his own ego. So many people come here because they too are in love with Bhagwan. They too are seeking the wisdom, the love that Bhagwan has to offer. He has so much love and he gives his love to everybody and it helps us to to find our love in ourselves. The followers of Jim Jones, leader of the People's Temple, were convinced that their relationship was built on love. And nearly 1,000 of his devoted disciples committed suicide at his command. It was their final gift of total surrender to the leader they loved. Their lives cut short by a madman claiming to be God, the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Guru Sai Baba is one of India's most powerful men with millions of Indian disciples and a growing Western following. He says of himself, I am God. My power is divine and has no limit. There is no force, natural or supernatural, that can stop me or my mission. Today, hundreds of these professing God-men are invading the West. Is there any need for a law? Or should we continue to welcome these gods of the new age? Prabhu Guptara, born and raised in India, is currently a journalist and media commentator in London. Gurus are going to the West because of two reasons. First, of course, they want to convert people. Uh, they want them to become followers of their own religion, in some cases themselves. And secondly, because they feel they have something to offer. What these gurus have to offer is a family, a community to belong to, which they don't have. Thousands of seekers, most of them from broken or unstable families, and already emotionally wounded, are becoming victims of the gurus. Dr. 
Dr. Oz Guinness, an Oxford scholar and noted world lecturer, is author of the bestseller, Dust of Death. One of the deepest longings in the modern world is for a sense of meaning and belonging, sense in their lives and sort of stability in their worlds. And people having not found that in the West are hungry for it. And reacting against the West, they're backing into the arms of the East without looking at it straight. Ed Senesi is a former member of the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, known as the Hare Krishna Movement. For three years, he was editor-in-chief of their magazine, Back to Godhead. The attitude toward the family in the Hare Krishna Movement is very unfortunate. The family is seen more or less as a necessary evil. Eckhart Floter, a successful German journalist, became a devoted disciple of Rajneesh in 1979 and spent several months with him in India. Rajneesh clearly says that the family, that marriage, that all these traditional family bonds are rotten. The only relationship that counts is between his disciples and him. Kathy, devoted disciple of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi for 15 years, was a teacher and governor of Transcendental Meditation, known as TM. I thought TM was strengthening my family, but it was really weakening it because I was turning all my attention in on myself. If you have an allegiance to your wife or your children, to the extent that you have that dedication to those people, you are less dedicated to the organization. I either had to become a member so I could go with him, or he was going to divorce me because he was not supposed to have any outside attachments. He said it wasn't that he didn't love me anymore, and in fact, he still loved me very much. It's just that I was only human, and Bhagwan was superhuman, and therefore he was more deserving of my husband's love than I was. How many of these people loved their neighbor, their family, in this totally giving way? How Alexandra Schmidt is one of France's leading experts on new religious amazing. movements. How many have been so blind to, to all the negative aspects of a person they loved as to that of the guru? Ellen is a spokeswoman for the Brahma Kumaras Raja Yoga Organization which is completely administered by women who control 800 centers in 40 countries. Our organization has the practice amongst all the participants of celibacy, um, whether in individuals or married couples. I found myself being attracted to my wife, but I couldn't because as soon as I felt attracted to her emotionally, physically, then it was difficult for me to maintain my celibacy. So the way I resolved that was to turn her into an object of, of dislike or hate. We have living proof of thousands of couples who are living in this way and are finding much greater harmony and pure love as opposed to limited physical love. Over 90% of the marriages in the Krishna movement end in divorce. Rather than using our energy in raising a family and being involved in many physical relationships, we're focusing that energy on spirituality. You see, what's so diabolical about all this is that it masquerades as spirituality. In some schools of thought, to be spiritual, celibacy is encouraged, and yet in others, sexual perversion is practiced, not only among the gurus themselves, but by their disciples, including young children. Contradictions are also seen in the attitude towards women who, on the spiritual level, are the focus of worship. Their femaleness is seen as the creative power of God. For instance, to be initiated by a female yogini is considered much holier than initiation by a male. And yet, on a day-to-day -day level, women are considered lower than men and treated as less than human. Dr. Johannes Ogard is a professor at Aarhus University in Denmark. He is considered to be one of Europe's leading experts on Hinduism and its worldwide missionary movement. It's fair to say that according to Hindu doctrine, there's no salvation for women. Meaning that if women are to be saved, they have to qualify by serving the males in this life in order that they may be born as males in the next life. I had a conversation with a group of Hare Krishna female missionaries. The leader argued without the slightest irony that the most foolish male is always more intelligent than the most intelligent female. In the religious communities in India, which are known as ashrams, there is absolutely no place for children. 
And here in the West, the gurus generally don't want the burden and responsibility of children because it distracts the parents from devotion to him and his cause. They have a school system whereby they force the children at age five to live in the ashram. A lot of the kids did think it was like a prison. They didn't get to go anywhere but the ranch. And while we're at school, it's really just a place for the kids to go to get out of the grown-ups' way. And they separate them from the mother and father, which is very unfortunate and very destructive. Well, the kids would, would want to see their mom and dad, you know, just to be with them as a family. The kids wouldn't even know where their parents were, and they'd have to go look for them. And when they did, parents were usually too busy to talk to them. And so the kids were mainly by themselves and unsupervised. The most heartbreaking result of the guru invasion to the West is the damage and harm it brings to the children. Those who have no other choice than to live in the ashram because their parents have chosen to follow the guru. Separated from parents and cut off from outside relatives, they become community property. They lose their individuality and identity and are alienated from society. Pastor Friedrich Hock has written over 30 books on various cults and is Germany's leading expert on new religious movements. Children brought up in a cult are only educated to follow the commands of their leaders. They never experienced freedom. They never experienced a responsible life where they could have their own choice, where they could follow their will. I've had these children to uh, taken them to parks and they've seen normal people and they'd recoil in fear from them because they don't look like devotees. They, the men don't have shaven heads or robes. I didn't want to leave the ranch. I'd rather stay there because I was scared of the people outside of it. Because, I don't know, you just got a feeling down there. So you were worked in to staying there. Now, why would an organization want to disrupt families like that? My own understanding in the cult dynamic is that it's a principle of control, divide and conquer. According to the Guru Gita, one of Hinduism's most important scriptures, the follower must not only adore and worship the Guru as God, but surrender himself and all his possessions as well. Most of the Gurus that I know of in the West are super rich. Gurus are more interested in white disciples than in Indian disciples, largely because they get more money from the whites. Rob, former transcendental meditator for 13 years, was a TM governor and in charge of teacher training at Maharishi International University. The TM movement is very wealthy. They have uh, land holdings all over the world. They have uh, beautiful hotels in Switzerland. They have uh, university campuses in the Midwest. They have academies on the East Coast, the West Coast. Here he was getting served on silver plates six times a day, sleeping on a very soft bed, riding around in a Mercedes. But supposedly he was so renounced that he wasn't attached to these things, so that gave him a right to enjoy them. Marcy made a statement that says, when the, wealth when the money comes to me, he says it's transcendental. Money is our last priority. Everything else is our first priority. Hundreds of gurus have grown incredibly rich in the West through tax-exempt donations. And the manufacture and distribution of every kind of memorabilia honoring these self-proclaimed godmen. They have acquired vast land holdings, armed bodyguards, and outrageous luxuries from posh hotels to their own fleets of planes helicopters, and as in Rajneesh's case, 40 Rolls Royces. Why not Rolls Royces? Why have anything less? This country is a capitalist country, and anything that produces or helps capitalism, why not? Anybody who says, why have Rolls Royce? I say, you're a communist. The guru's hypocrisy is diabolical. Criticizing the materialism and commercialism in the West and convincing their followers that non-materialism will get them up the spiritual ladder, these gods of the new age are laughing all the way to the bank. 
I know of groups involved in drug trafficking, smuggling, prostitution, and the buying and selling of weapons, all done to earn money for the guru. I know of a variety of uh, female disciples who were prostitutes in Bombay and making money with this. I have evidence that the Rajneesh organization is making a lot of their income through illegal trafficking of drugs into this country. If you have, have your head in the right place, you can create money. It is an art. They were encouraged to smuggle dope from India to Europe, and from this money, they could pay their workshops. If they have to tell you they're with the Christian Children's Fund, or they're with the Salvation Army, or they're using the money to find men missing in action in Vietnam, whatever they have to do to get the money, they'll do that because they believe what their guru told them, that the end justifies the means. Hinduism teaches you to die to the voice of conscience inside that says, it's wrong. It teaches that there is no sin. This can be seen in the way that gurus and their disciples justify murder, violence, robbery, bribery, and crooked business transactions, all done in the name of heavenly deception. People were encouraged not only to spy on each other when they were not properly surrendering to the master. People were encouraged to lie to each other. The mail is censored. We know of bribery with local politicians. People undergo, as I did, a change in their value system and become confused about what is right and what is wrong. Another danger that you can see in a lot of the Eastern thinking is the sort of syncretism and the failure to make distinctions so that you d transcend not just right and wrong, but this and that. And I think it's very important to say there are distinctions, not just between right and wrong, between all sorts of things, to think critically, to think clearly. The whole philosophy of Hinduism is very relative. There are no absolute moral standards upon which to act. Your feeling of right or wrong would change according to your level of consciousness. You can become so completely under the power of this particular person that you refuse to think, or if you like, you're unable to think you can lose the power to take decisions of any sort, no matter how trifling, in any area of your life. Sally Belfridge, former resident of Rajneesh's religious community in India, wrote of her disillusionment in her book, Flowers of Emptiness. I felt more and more kind of drawn into his, uh, his, this emptiness of his. It's impossible to describe. It's more than charisma. Charisma doesn't do it justice at all. It's more than an aura. I really believe that he knew something I didn't, that he was on a plane that I was not. They ask you for total and also brainless obedience and worship because they are God and they are more than human and you have to follow these gods. You are not asked to deal with your brain and to ask questions. I discover with amazement and dismay the readiness of people to submit. So many people in the world feel that they've got to fling themselves headlong and believe and give up their autonomy. People love to give up this heavy freedom that we have to carry with all the, the decisions and the effort it implies. Freedom in the East is freedom from individuality. So it's a detached freedom that has no high place of man. And a lot of the Eastern way of thinking is like a sort of mist that falls in, or it's been described as, a, as an embrace that smothers any differences. I found that I lost my identity somehow. He had no identity. He was a sort of conduit to the infinite. And I was somehow at the receiving end of something very strange and extraordinary. It is part of the world of illusion, and the goal is to withdraw and detach yourself from it. So there's no high view of, say, social action or compassion or an outraged concern to see justice in this world. On the contrary, if you do things like that, very often you're just tinkering with a person's karma. They believe that when a person suffers, that that is what he's due as a result of the law of karma, because you've done something very sinful in this lifetime or in a past lifetime, so there's very little compassion. One just w was taught to ignore all of the dreadful, I mean, the intolerable poverty and suffering of India. There were beggars clustering around the gates of the ashram day and night 
children starving, living in little huts, surrounding what was supposed to be a religious community. The contradiction was disgusting to me, but most of the sannyasins failed to notice it. It appeared not to bother them in the least. Life is suffering. Therefore, you cannot escape suffering without escaping life. Interfering with suffering, entering into suffering, is totally ununderstandable for a real Hindu. I was a member of the Social Service League at the college, and we were trying to do what we could to help people in the villages. A gentleman who was head of the Department of Hindi came around to us and said, why are you doing this? These people who are suffering in the villages, sick or diseased or whatever, have come to earth in this state because they have done something wrong in their past lives. Now, no matter what you do to them, if you cut short their suffering in this life, what will happen is they will simply come back in their next life in the same state or a worse state. So you're really wasting your time. Suffering is there, and you can't do anything about it but you can meditate yourself away from suffering. We feel that the cause of suffering is within, and so to allow people to experience peace themselves, we teach courses in meditation. They seek to escape suffering by numbing their emotions and compassion through meditation. Maharishi, TM's guru, once said that a hungry person can become a happy hungry person through practicing meditation. Humanitarian activities are again, by principle, foreign to Hinduism. When they are found within Hinduism, it is a direct influence from the Christian missionary movement, a sort of imitation of Christian missionary activity. Contrast, say, part of the Eastern view with the Christian view. One of the stories I've heard that meant a lot to many people is the story of the Zen poet Isa in the 17th century. He lost all five of his children and then his wife, whom he greatly loved. And each time one of them died, he went to the Zen master and said, now how can I take this? And the master said, always remember the world is due, DW. In other words, the sun rises, the dew disappears. Don't get hassled, don't involve yourself in mourning and grief. And he went home and wrote what became his most famous poem. And transliterated into English, it goes like this. The world is due, the world is due, and yet, and yet. In other words, the world is due, there's the logic of Buddhism, and yet, and yet, the humanness, which is not satisfied or fulfilled because it wants more of an answer than that. Now, you compare that, say, with Jesus, who face to face with death, was not detached or uninvolved. He was angry and he wept. Why? Because death is outrageous. God didn't make the world like this. Something's out of joint, something's wrong. And the Christian view sees evil and death as the wrong they are, and therefore fights them. And that's what the East lacks. In the Christian tradition, the suffering is taken so seriously that God himself had to enter it and take it upon himself. Without this taking upon himself the suffering of mankind, there is no Christianity. That's the heart of Christianity. Although the Hindu tries to convince himself that suffering is only in his mind, an illusion, as he calls it, Maya. At the same time, he believes that he has to suffer again and again by forever being forced to return to this world through reincarnation. There is no escape from this endless wheel of samsara, life and death, because in Hinduism, unlike Christianity, there is no forgiveness because there is no sin. Therefore, sadly, also, there is no hope. All the gurus that I know of in the Western world teach reincarnation, a doctrine very central to Hinduism. Reincarnation is all about dying and coming back to this world in one form or the other. Hare Krishna people believe in transmigration of the soul, as they prefer to call it, traveling from body to body to body. These physical bodies don't last forever, even though the soul does. So in the same way that a driver needs to change cars, in the same way we need to change from one body to another. Gandhi called reincarnation a burden too great to bear. Yet it is being eagerly embraced in the West in diluted form, as part of a patent blend of Hinduism and Zen Buddhism, camouflaged with psychological terminology. This New Age religion is promoted through thousands of worldwide networks and hundreds of major gatherings, such as this Mind-Body-Spirit Festival held in Los Angeles. 
It is a westernized version of India's Kumbh Mela and promotes many of the same gurus and practices from astrology and palmistry to psychic readings, healings, and meditations. The festival, now international, was started in London in 1977 by Graham Wilson. He explains the New Age interpretation of reincarnation as an upward evolution to a higher species of mankind. Um, we don't just reincarnate uh, as an individual soul into a new body each time, but uh, more of the, there's a collective consciousness of souls, which is why I think we have access to a lot more information than we realize. Either one has to believe in reincarnation or resurrection. They both could not be true at the same time. There are those who believe that Jesus was a reincarnation of Krishna or Buddha or some other great master of the past, but the Bible would absolutely refute that. Until the early 60s, only an elite few in the West believed in reincarnation. Today, this belief is accepted by nearly 25% of Americans and about 50% of Europeans. Likewise, yoga was once practiced mainly by an occultist clique in America and Europe. Now, over 19 million Americans and millions more in Europe are actively involved in some kind of Eastern meditation. Altogether, 60 million Americans have incorporated Eastern philosophies into their worldview. The Bible teaches that Jesus came once and for all. When he died, he did not reincarnate, he resurrected. It is appointed unto all men to die once, and after death comes the judgment, the judgment of God. I noticed that in the Western world, reincarnation has become something of a fad. However, in India and in Asia as a whole, reincarnation is certainly not a fad. It is a form of punishment. This circle of life and death, dying and living, is a horrible understanding. It is understood as a horrible concept within Hinduism because the only aim of the Hindu religiosity at its core is to get out of this circle, to escape this endless living and dying. And the means to get out of this circle of suffering is yoga. Yoga goes all the way back to the Hindu god Shiva who is called Yogeshvara, meaning Lord of Yoga. You find yoga being taught in several of the major Hindu scriptures. Krishna, one of the many Hindu gods, was an advocate of yoga. Yoga is also mentioned in the Gita as the main means to attaining salvation. The word means basically to yoke, union. The goal of the Hindu is to be yoked with Brahman. Brahman is the Hindu concept of God, the all or the absolute. Yoga, in its many westernized forms, is also at the heart of the New Age movement that has adopted Hinduism's basic beliefs and goals. In spite of the seeming variety in hundreds of competitive schools of yoga, all forms come out of India and lead into the occult, though most Westerners are not aware of this. Yoga techniques include breathing exercises, or prana, positions called asanas, dissolving the mind, known as Leia, psychic powers called Siddhis, repetitious chanting named Mantra, and deliberately cultivating black magic, known as Tantra. In my extensive travels in India, I have encountered a number of Westerners who have got into Hinduism and begun following Hindu gurus as a result of a very simple initiation into a yoga class. Yoga is in many ways the heart of Hinduism. There is no Hinduism without yoga, and there is no yoga without Hinduism. Although there are many types of yoga, the one most familiar in the West often passes for physical exercise and is called Hatha Yoga. It promises mental and physical health, but its Hindu roots and real goal to yoke with Brahman are seldom taught. Ellen believes that Raja Yoga, or Yoga of the Mind, 
is the highest form of Hinduism. The Brahma Kumari's Raj Yoga is a form of meditation where the soul begins to understand itself clearly and has a connection with the Supreme Being. Raj means royal and yoga means union, so the link with the Supreme Being. And through this yoga, I become the ruler over my own self, over my mind and my life. Johanna Michelson, former yoga teacher and assistant to a psychic surgeon, tells of her experiences in the occult in her autobiography, The Beautiful Side of Evil. Another word for mantra is charm, or to cast a spell, if you will. And in mantra yoga, a word or a phrase or the name of a, a demon god is repeated over and over and over again to bring the individual to a vibration level that will attract that which is being chanted for, to bring about the desired effect. It's exactly what the white witches and magicians, so-called, use in the casting of their spells. We were always told, no, it's just a, mean, a meaningless sound. It had nothing to do with Hindu gods. But every time a person would sit down, they'd be invoking a Hindu god by thinking that mantra over and over again, be stronger in their life. Om Namo Narayana, Om Namo Narayana, Om Namo Narayana. It's just one of them. <laughs> goes Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare 108 mantras is one round and they chant that 16 times a day that takes two hours to do every day that's the minimum requirement the guru exacts from them thereby the mind or the brain is emptied and you get a clear mind as they call it a thoughtless mind it's sometimes referred to as a hypnotizing or brainwash technique because whenever you're having a problem or running into some confrontation, you retreat to the security of the chanting instead of thinking a problem through. George Harrison of the Beatles made mantra yoga acceptable to the world through his song, My Sweet Lord, where he incorporated the chant to a Hindu god. Hare Krishna simultaneously with the biblical shout of praise, hallelujah. He said he did this deliberately to show that both religions are the same and to make Hinduism more acceptable. To pretend that all religions are the same is dishonest, as is the merger of various religious techniques. For instance, more and more Christians use the name Jesus much like a mantra. They claim that it's a tool to get them into the presence of God. Jesus said that repetitious prayer is not acceptable to God. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, originator of TM, claims to have put Eastern meditation on the mystical map. With over three million followers, TM is the largest guru movement ever to invade the West. The Beatles' much publicized visit to Maharishi's community in India in the 60s convinced their millions of fans that TM, the so-called scientific yoga, was an even more powerful way to bliss consciousness than drugs. What makes TM unique and different from any other practice that's going on today is that it offers enlightenment very quickly. It offered a jet, a jet ride, you might say, to... Uh, self-realization. I started experiencing being lost in this state of awareness called the absolute. In essence, Marishi taught that we all come from that nothingness and that is the source of all our consciousness, of all of our thinking and everything we do. Maharishi's primary thrust is the marketing of his city yoga, which is designed to develop psychic powers such as levitation. These courses, like most guru programs, cost thousands of dollars. Rob was able to finance his advanced training through government student loans, totaling $6,000. During these uh, sessions, it's a very strange environment. People speak in tongues, they yell and they scream, they talk in foreign languages. It's like a madhouse, and it's real crazy. Everyone bouncing around on foam pads, flying up in the air. Rajneesh is one of India's most controversial gurus, largely because of his endorsement of shocking sexual practices as a prerequisite for salvation.
His brand of yoga called dynamic meditation is a new age combination of Hinduism and psychotherapies. This exercise involving rigorous breathing and hyperventilation is designed to arouse the serpent force called Kundalini, which the gurus believe lies coiled at the base of the spine. I did dynamic meditation every day. We also called it Kundalini meditation. It starts off with a cathartic breathing, and the reason for it is just to move your energy and to get you out of your head and into your body, and you just breathe. The next phase, the screaming phase of dynamic meditation, feels like when you finally had an opportunity to throw a tantrum when you were a little kid. By the time you get to the third phase of jumping up and down and yelling who, you're hardly there at all. And so it's pretty hard to remember what happens when you're there. I guess the closest thing I can associate it with is mindlessness. You get to a place where your mind actually leaves your body. Your body's just jumping up and down and your voice from your gut is yelling who, and you're not doing it anymore. You become one with this whole energy. phase in dynamic is a quiet space someone yells stop and you've just been doing 30 minutes of intense catharsis and what happens after being in such incredibly intense movement for so long is just a feeling of peacefulness and stillness my mind actually stops and I feel a oneness with the whole universe there have been glowing reports published giving credit to the gurus and their pseudo-psychological techniques, but neglecting to mention the thousands of cases of emotional and mental breakdowns, insanity, suicide, beatings, murder, rapes going on in guru centers, various guru centers worldwide. It is alarming to realize these dangerous techniques for enlightenment are being incorporated in psychotherapies, self-help seminars, and are even being accepted in mainstream Protestant and Catholic churches and seminaries. One of the fastest growing yogas in the West today is Tantra seductively offered as an exotic means for enhancing one's sexual experiences. Like all yoga, it is designed to provoke possession by Hindu spirits in order to break the chain of reincarnation. In Tantra, advanced disciples indulge in the most degenerate behavior, from human sacrifices to sexual perversion and sorcery. Tantra yoga is the extreme expression of Hinduism. If you will, it's the black and so-called white magic in which the Shakti, the Kundalini force, is aroused, the psychic powers that accompany it are in full bloom, 
and the individual, depending on his personal preference, can channel this force either into the black magic, which includes rites of meditating upon severed heads, human heads in India, and eating bits of flesh and the unconsumed parts of uh, the cremation rites and other practices, horrifying practices, or they can take it into what they call the white magic, part of it, in which they are using this power, this force, for healing, for the benefit of mankind, if you will. Yet Anton LaVey, the Pope of the First Church of Satan, has said it very explicitly. He said that to believe there's any such thing as white magic is mythology. There is no such thing as white magic. All of it has its source in occult psychic power, and it has nothing whatever to do with, the, with God. Toby is a yoga teacher at the Scandinavian Yoga and Meditation School in Aarhus, Denmark, which promotes Tantra Yoga. Tantra means to free the mind through expanding the awareness. That means to be able to meet more and more of the reality in everyday life. Although yoga is sold to the West through various gimmicks and techniques, its basic occultism remains the same. The hope of immortality is at its heart, and the dream of realizing one's own inherent divinity is its ultimate purpose, becoming a Christ, they call it. Despite the claims that yoga is only physical and non-religious, it is the very essence of Hinduism spirituality. It eventually leads to the realm of the spiritual, to meditation, where the person looks into himself to find the true self, and in finding the true self, he believes he's finding God. This new yoga in the West went into a sort of amalgamation with occult and Gnostic groups. And the Hindu mythology was put forward in a sort of demythologized way, which we now recognize in such terminology as New Age. The age of the enlightened man, the age of Superman, the man with super consciousness has begun. God is losing all importance. Man is the only thing which matters. And man is saving himself by his knowledge, by the development of his mind faculties. You know, the frightening thing to me now, as I look back, is I started having exper the experience that I was God. And as God, I could completely structure my life and my universe exactly the way I wanted it. Dave Hunt, noted author and lecturer, is one of America's leading experts on the New Age. His books include the bestseller, Peace, Prosperity, and the Coming Holocaust. He explains that Hinduism is based upon the same ideas that the Bible says the serpent introduced to Eve in the Garden of Eden. The yogis teach the same lies that the serpent in Genesis 3 deceived Eve with, that death is merely the doorway to reincarnation, and that humans can become gods. This is either an unbelievable coincidence or an unmistakable identification of the mastermind behind Eastern mysticism. This mastermind is called Satan in the Bible and is also known as the serpent, the ultimate power of Hinduism symbolized by the serpent, is glorified and worshipped in Hinduism. <laughs> We see God as the form of light, and the name Shiva is used by our group, um, but meaning incorporeal being, radiating peace, radiating light, love to the whole world. In India, Shiva is known as the god of destruction. He haunts the cremation grounds and wears a necklace of human skulls and wears serpents in his hair. His power is worshipped. Hindu texts describe the power as the fiery serpent within, called Kundalini. This Kundalini yoga is now at the heart of nearly all yoga. Even yoga schools which pretend to be purely technical Hatha yogi schools, in their heart are Kundalini yogi. Uh, they are arousing the Kundalini, but they don't speak about the Kundalini. They speak about the energy, getting the energy up, raising the energy, and indicating that this simply means that they get more healthy and sound. Many people are talking about Kundalini and really it does mean energy. That means whatever you call it, it is about energy. To take away blocks in your energy system 
so you are able to uh, function in a more uh, effective level. The serpent has been known as energy or the force and worshipped as the symbol of wisdom and immortality in every religion and culture. Only in the Judeo-Christian Bible is the serpent identified as deceiver, destroyer, arch enemy of God and man. The old dread and fear of the serpent is being subtly removed from our culture. Even children in schools are being taught to accept the snake through yoga positions like the cobra. Michelle, could you show us how we do the cobra? That's it, arch your back. That's good. Look forward. Good. Can you hold it for a second? Rousing this serpent power and forcing it into the spine, driving it upwards through a number of chakras, which are centers, you are expected to go divine, to become superhuman, to get supernatural powers. The breathing exercises are designed to teach you to absorb the prana, the energy life force in the cosmos, to channel it into the chakras, the uh, psychic channels, thus awakening the Shakti force, the Kundalini force, and bringing about those psychic powers, which are such an integral and prevalent part in yoga. So very slowly, let's breathe in through our nose, very slowly, breathe in, breathe out. There are many dangers in the breathing techniques. Even the writers and the proponents of these exercises are quick to warn that not only do these things trigger emotional and mental diseases which have been known to place people even in insane asylums for the rest of their lives but they also recognize that these exercises can open your soul and your mind and your entire being to a takeover by demonic forces the followers of the gurus themselves have been forced to form an emergency spiritual network of 4500 mds and psychiatrists to treat those who are freaking out on Eastern mysticism. But the real yoga means gradually cut the relationship between your soul and the bodily world. You stop your life processes. You stop your thinking. No thoughts are allowed in the mind. Many people don't realize this, but it's terribly dangerous to go into a meditative state in which the mind is simply left blank. And that ultimately is the purpose of the meditations in yoga. It's like opening the door to a room. Whatever comes through, you have no control over. It is simply not true that yoga teaches you to breathe in the best possible way. Yoga teaches you to reduce the breathing down to a minimum and finally to stop it. You also have to stop all the movements of the body, all the movements of the muscles, the nerves, and bring your body to a complete standstill. In fact, there are some of the Hatha yogic exercises which can be used as a sort of gymnastics. But fundamentally, it isn't gymnastics. It's in the same way as serving in the army has certain healthy aspects and perspectives. You get stronger, you get more vigorous. But the aim of the army is certainly not health care. The aim of it is to learn how to kill the same with yoga. The aim of yoga is to learn how to kill yourself off, to get rid of life and death. I thought I was being strengthened, but what I was really doing is flipping into an altered state of consciousness, a form of self-hypnosis, which is very weakening to the mind and to the body. But this weakness made me afraid to give it up. The biggest danger I found in, in practicing transcendental meditation was the dependency on the technique itself. It's kind of like drugs. A, a, a drug addict doesn't want to give up his drugs and because the experience is so pleasing and he feels his life will crumble around him if he doesn't have it. It is in fact a sort of psychotic withdrawal. Being afraid of contact with the external world, you create your totally alternative inner world. I thought I'd have the experience of like leaving Shangri-La and all of a sudden turning old and weak and disintegrating. I was afraid that I would lose my, my clarity and my energy. But little did I know, when I did give it up, I gained all these things that I never had when I meditated. Once a religion for Indians alone, Hinduism has become radically evangelistic. 
through adopting the principles of Christian missionaries who introduced cultural and social reforms in India. In 1966, at an international Hindu conference, leading Hindus planned a strategy to convert the world. The gurus were chosen as the first crusaders. And their tens of millions of converts are now the first Western Hindus. At the World Congress of Hinduism in 1979, a spokesman declared that our mission in the West has been crowned with fantastic success. Hinduism is becoming the dominant world religion, and the end of Christianity has come near. At the 1981 TM conference in India, a spokesman stated that the entire mission of TM is to counter the ever-spreading demon of Christianity. And therefore, Hinduism is by nature anti-Christian. It's not just that Hindus don't like Christianity, but the whole Hindu understanding is the absolute opposite, the real alternative to Christianity. The religion that is out to destroy Christianity is being embraced by millions, including many in the church today who are naively succumbing to spiritual propaganda and unwittingly becoming disciples of the gods of the new age. Behind today's aggressive campaign for world Hindu domination is a secretive organization called the Vishva Hindu Parishad. It is the world missionary organization of Hinduism. Reading from its constitution, paragraph four, to establish an order of missionaries, both lay and initiate the purpose of propagating dynamic Hinduism and going on, the purpose being to open, manage, and assist seminaries or centers for training such missionaries. The word missionary returns in the Constitution several times, and it's clearly indicated that this is a world organization for Hinduism. The Hindu Visa Parishad, in its magazine, very clearly states that the yoga teachers in various parts of the world are the front missionaries of Hinduism. Obviously, they don't know it, but they are looked upon like that by these people who are running the central organization. The teachers themselves are being duped, hypnotized, brainwashed, whatever you want to call it, but not seeing what is really happening there. While a guru disciple, Prema Nayak, was an accomplished yoga teacher for 10 years. Yoga teachers are blind leading the blind. They themselves do not understand what they're into. They don't have any idea what they're teaching. Uh, this is really being used to reach the souls of students and innocent people in this country and other countries who come for an exercise class. As I look back on it, I see it was a subtle infiltrating of my beliefs and ideas it totally changed my world view. It gave me little or no moral standards by which to, to guide my life. I was becoming a, a Hindu, and it was a very big deception. The Vishva Hindu Parishad's plot to convert the world to Hinduism has created thousands of New Age worldwide networks with tens of millions of converts, all working for a new one world government. Through the repackaging of yoga, the Western mind is being systematically conditioned to accept a neo-pagan worldview. Combined with New Age thinking, it claims to offer more integrity, selflessness, goodwill, freedom, and says it is the very alternative to Christianity's narrow way. Yoga is really part of our society now. It's being sold everywhere as technique for relaxation, for becoming unstressed, brighter, more beautiful. The self-centered world of glamour promotes yoga, meditation, and visualization techniques as a means to a healthier and more beautiful body, mind, and spirit. Spirituality is in, but with an anti-biblical meaning. 
Even relaxation has become a spiritual quest for one's so-called full potential through holistic massage, isolation tanks, and hundreds of other new age techniques. Most of the 2,000 YMCA's across America offer yoga classes. And nearly two-thirds of all universities and colleges make yoga available as part of the curriculum. Many of the people practicing yoga that I have met say to me that they only practice it because of the physical benefits. Any Hindu would tell you, however, that there is no yoga that is purely physical. One of the first things I learned in my teacher's training class was that I must talk to the students about the philosophy behind yoga, that this was just as important as the exercises. I will count Relaxation at the end of yoga class is really hypnosis, where each part of the body is relaxed. So while they were in this state, I read to them about the Hindu philosophy or something from one of my guru's books. So they got it whether they wanted it or not. Yoga exercises were not designed for physical fitness, but to realign the serpent force within the body, to achieve godhood, that yoking, which is what yoga means with Brahman. Anyone interested in physical fitness ought to do exercises designed for that, not yoga. Many hospitals have set up their own yoga and meditation classes to provide stress reduction for patients, doctors, and nurses. Doctors and dentists who wouldn't think of promoting Christianity or Judaism on the grounds that it is religious are unwittingly involving their patients in Hindu practices. The last two years I've been working with some German doctors that was in research of breathing exercises. In uh, our Danish school, we get patients from the doctors, typical with a baguette, with nervous symptoms, with high blood pressure, with stress, and so on. In addition to promoting yoga, fitness and health magazines advocate various schools of vegetarianism, a practice essential to Hinduism. An extreme example is macrobiotics, which attempts to manipulate spirituality through diet. Marashid once said that vegetarianism was the highest form of, of diet. This is essential in order to have deep experiences in meditation because the vibrations in animal products are innately of the nature to pull the soul down into the lower levels. I find it intriguing that so many of the people in India and those in advanced yoga in the West who feel that the consumption of meat lowers their vibration level think nothing about drinking their own urine or better still cow's urine which the holiest of men in India recognizes having special redemptive qualities. We only eat food that's prepared by yogis who are in remembrance of the Supreme Being so that those vibrations are filled in the food and these affect the mind very much. They also teach that anyone outside the movement is more or less evil. He's a meat eater. He's a karmi. You're not able to have as much endurance, not as much strength because I was a vegetarian for many years. Lost a lot of my strength. I'm just old typical American cracker. And the changes that have taken place in my life are tremendous. I've uh, quit my so-called wicked ways, in other words, killing game and, and eating the flesh of animals. I'm strict vegetarian, as this diet so ordains. God did not ordain vegetarianism. Jesus was not a vegetarian. He fed the multitude with fish on more than one occasion. He himself ate fish and the Passover lamb. While the Bible would not condemn vegetarianism as a means for health, it would condemn it as a means for spiritual enlightenment. Health food stores are among the main fronts for guru organizations in recruiting and are major distributors of New Age literature. Thousands of MDs, PhDs, chiropractors and dentists are enthusiastic proponents of New Age holistic medicine. These New Age practitioners operate from the premise that treatment of the body must begin with treatment of the mind and spirit. These therapies involve countless techniques, most of which incorporate altering one's consciousness or hypnosis. Always part of the occult, hypnosis has become the main bridge between Hinduism and modern science. Hypnosis creates the same states of consciousness that you experience under drugs and in yoga. 
accepted in medicine and psychiatry, hypnosis is the heart of self-improvement and positive mental attitude courses. And hundreds of misinformed Christian psychologists use hypnosis in their daily counseling. Even in the church today, faith in God is being replaced by faith in our faith, in our positive thinking, in the idea that somehow if I can make myself believe that something will happen, then it really will. This is a counterfeit of the true faith. Many believe that hypnosis is okay if used by qualified counselors. Somehow used by the right people makes it scientific and not occultic. So Christians naively use it, as do many of the new consciousness movements like Est, Scientology, Mind Dynamics, Silver Mind Control, and Alpha Brainwave Training. In pursuit of Freudian myths, psychiatrists use hypnosis to regress patients back into their childhood and into the womb where they relive the traumas of their birth, despite the scientific fact that the prenatal, natal, and early postnatal brain is not sufficiently developed to carry memories. I did indeed experience my original birth thought, but I felt it wasn't enough. I went back and I experienced my thought during my conception, and then I went back from there to a previous lifetime to experience why I had structured my conception the way I did. I mean, it's never ending. You can just keep going. Moreover, they take them right back into prior lives where they come out with factual uh, recountings of lives they've lived all over this earth. Obviously, the memory is not coming from the brain. It's coming from a deceptive source. The field of medicine is embracing numerous New Age beliefs that cannot be explained scientifically, such as acupuncture, which claims to manipulate the kundalini force with needles, and biofeedback, which uses a monitoring device to train a person to control ordinarily involuntary functions, such as blood pressure. The Manager Clinic's documentary on biofeedback calls it the yoga of the West. Elmer and Alice Green, pioneer biofeedback researchers, admit that it creates the same state of consciousness and results as yoga. This electronic yoga has now been introduced by psychologists into the world of sports, including the Olympics. Businessmen are coming to yoga today because they want to be relaxed in the middle of their day. They want to train their ability to concentrate. Self-help therapies are a motivational tool used by hundreds of competitive businesses across America. Weekend success and positive mental attitude seminars and mail-order subliminal persuasion cassettes promise to improve personal and business performance through a blend of humanistic psychology and Eastern mysticism. One such course called New Age Thinking for Developing Your Full Potential has changed thousands of lives for such prestigious clients as the IRS, CIA, U.S. Army, Navy, and Air Force, NASA, General Motors, IBM, Xerox, Rockwell International, Bell Telephone System, Bank of America, and scores of police and fire departments. The human potential movement with its emphasis upon self, self-esteem, self-love, self-acceptance, a positive self-image, is simply a westernized version of the yogis self-realization, the guru's concept of the divine within, that we're all God. Rolling Thunder, the Shoshone Indian medicine man, has said, scientists will eventually discover what pagans have always known. That's exactly what's happening through the invasion of Eastern mysticism into the West. Many leading scientists have enthusiastically embraced Eastern mysticism in recent years. Hinduism, which claims to be the oldest religion, is being deceptively packaged as the new science. And a lot of the East is very seductively packaged. It's put over very carefully so that they don't stress the religious side, they'll put the scientific. They don't stress the spiritual side, they'll put the physical fitness or whatever. The yoga we teach has nothing to do with religion. It is scientific methods in the way that you do something and then you get results. Maharishi found out that in the United States the people would not buy the religion package. 
So offered the scientific package, started getting scientists involved, started to do experiments on meditators such as the breath rate, the brainwave patterns, etc. And when they found out that the metabolic rates lowered during meditation, they found they could present it scientifically and people would buy it better that way. Even as teachers, we were taught the puja ceremony, we were bowing down to Hindu gods, and yet we didn't really feel we were teaching a religion. I think that's extremely deceptive and dishonest because the deeper you get into it, for instance, as people are initiated and so on, what they're taught is the pujas and the basic words and the rituals that are Hindu worship. Of course, many Englishmen and Americans don't realize what the words mean, but if they just asked what the Sanskrit meant, they'd realize that's fundamentally religious and the whole thing is basically, in that sense, dishonest. Children practice it. It is used for teaching languages. Uh, it is used for the businessmen, for all levels of society. It's taught in the schools. In schools across the Western world, from kindergarten through university, Hindu occultism is being openly taught in spite of the otherwise enforced separation between church and state. Guru Thakar Singh was invited to speak at a high school in Southern California. Kurt, a student there, became so overwhelmed that he actually moved to India, where he is now a devoted follower of Thakar. It's only half an hour talk and 20 minutes meditation. And the experience I had while there was, was like nothing I'd ever, ever experienced before. And just the air, the energy in the chapel where he was speaking was just electrified with feelings of, of love and, and just a peace, a hushed quiet that was just bewildering to me. It seems outrageous that in public schools across America where Christian prayer has been outlawed, yoga, Eastern meditation and visualization techniques which are simply forms of Hindu prayer are not only allowed, they're being actively promoted. Here in some of the schools in the West, in the PE classes, after having started with the physical aspects of yoga, the teacher eventually has the kids chanting words like Om, Brahma or Krishna, names of the gods. Starting right down from the teacher to the student, we learned that the yoga could really help the kids um, reduce tension and center themselves. Many teachers are now being encouraged to develop a mass consciousness among the students. Let's relax. We're going to very slowly lift our hands up. Children are taught to let go of their critical faculties and center in on their intuitive feelings and experiences. Just really, really relax. Imagine that you're on top of a really soft and fluffy cloud. Then you're just really relaxed comfortable just see that blue sky in your mind one of the ways that the consciousness of the masses can most powerfully be influenced is through the mass media which is increasingly being used for promoting Indian consciousness the film Gandhi was probably the most effective piece of Indian propaganda to invade the West it was a political advertisement controlled and heavily financed by the Indian government and promoted by the peace movement. It propagates a false message of Hindu religious tolerance and non-violence. Historical accuracy was discarded. Gandhi was no different from most gurus today in that he was a sexual pervert and was certainly not the non-violent, peace-loving man as demonstrated in his racial killings of blacks in the Kafir Wars in South Africa. The most important message of the film was that Gandhi was one of the first gurus to link Christianity and Hinduism to form one package, a new religion. I consider him to be one of the fathers of the New Age movement. So many of the most popular films today, like Close Encounters, Poltergeist, E.T., Return of the Jedi, Star Wars, are all based upon Hinduism. For example, the Force has a dark and a light side, that's black magic and white magic. 
the doorway into the occult is an altered state of consciousness. This is the way that Obi-Wan initiates Luke into the Force. He has him working a laser sword. He says, Luke, your problem is you're trying to think. He puts a visor over his face so he can't see. And he says, Luke, you got to tune it out and let the Force take over. That's an altered state of consciousness. In The Empire Strikes Back, Yoda is a yogi. He's got Luke standing on his head going through various contortions to develop the mind power to raise his spaceship out of the swamp. And when Luke can't do it, Yoda does. And Luke looks on and says, I don't believe it. And Yoda says, that's your problem. In other words, it's all in the mind. If you would only believe it, it would happen. And when Luke goes into the cave to confront Darth Vader, Yoda says, don't take your laser sword, Luke. You don't need it. All you need is within you. That's the divine within. And when he cuts off Darth Vader's head and it rolls to the ground and he opens the visor and sees his own head, that's the most powerful presentation of Eastern mysticism you could ask for. The Beatles sang it, I am you and you are me and he is she and all is one. We are raising an entire generation of children under the bombardment of cartoons and television shows and fantasy role-playing games and movies that are telling them that the occult and Eastern philosophy is a wonderful thing, not something to be afraid of, not something ugly and fearful, but something beautiful with the darling reptilian creatures, with the great psychic powers that are drawing these children into an acceptance of things that are dangerous beyond anyone's comprehension. The minds of children are being trained in the use of the supernatural and taught the principle of creating what seems like reality through Hindu psycho-spiritual techniques of mind power. Dungeons and Dragons, for example, requires participants to mentally murder, rape, torture, and otherwise commit mayhem with the aid of occultic powers. In at least one popular game, Hindu deities like the goddess Kali are invoked. Hindu religious techniques, including repeated chants, visualization, and casting spells, are used to overcome enemies. For you students who are new to our fantasy games class today, we're going to be playing Dungeons and Dragons, and I'd like to um, talk about a few of the advantages of using Dungeons and Dragons in a classroom. You may be wondering why you get to play games in school time. These games are used in gifted children's programs throughout the United States. A clear majority of state-supported schools and colleges incorporate them into their curriculum. And uh, we call this an integrated curriculum. You guys are kind of familiar with that. You may encounter some violent creatures on the way, but the object is to be able to dispose of this ring that is the symbol of evil in the kingdom of Middle-earth. A child can understand the dark and light side of the Force. And to understand the Force is to understand basic Hinduism. George Lucas, creator of the Star Wars series, is in real life a devout believer in the Force, which he says can enable anyone to read minds, see past and future events, levitate, and plug into a nether world of psychic energy. The Eastern gurus, the occultists, cultists of every description, have taken the terms of the Bible and felt every liberty to redefine them according to their basic presuppositions. God becomes not a personal individual, a spirit with whom we have a personal relationship. Through his son, Jesus Christ, he becomes an impersonal force. God is... Uh something, an energy that permeates every one of us, each and every one of us, and it's both uh, personal and non-personal. Jesus becomes not the way, the truth, and the life, but an avatar, a way shower, one of many paths to God. Jesus Christ, of course, was uh, an enlightened master. Bhagwan is another Jesus, another Buddha. Jesus Christ was a great master, like our master is today. The word made flesh, as the Bible puts it. Jesus himself warned us that in the last days, many would come claiming to be Christ and Messiah. Our landscape today is literally crawling with individuals claiming to be Christ, and the Eastern gurus are right on the top of the list. There are two things the gurus have done. On the one hand, they've used Eastern-type words that are floating about in the West, words like energy, vibrations, and so on. 
And they've also used words, phrases, ideas from the Bible, from the teachings of Jesus, misused them, twisted them around to draw people to themselves, to suggest that the things that Jesus was talking about are actually the things they are talking about, when actually it's not so at all. In Holy Bible, it has been explained uh, very uh, explicit, explicitly that be ye perfect even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. And we are also basically the same as he is. And when you know you're a perfect man, then you can go upward and you can become divine. Each human being is naturally peaceful, naturally pure, naturally good. And the quality of evil is our unnatural state. So in meditation, we're practicing that focusing on the original, pure, divine self, which is our true state. If humans are inherently good, then why do they lie, cheat, steal, make war? Whatever good there is within us, apparently, isn't enough to keep us from doing evil. Therefore, to seek salvation from within is to seek it from the wrong source. We're not separated from our higher self. We're separated from God by sin. Ernst Winter has a PhD in international law. He was a diplomat in the Austrian Foreign Service for 10 years, and from 1968 through 78 was a director with the United Nations. My greatest concern really is the growing interest and dedication and application of Eastern mystical thought and practices within traditional Christian groups and churches. There's a vacuum, there's a longing. They want to be filled with, quote, religious experience. Today's New Age teachings falsely claim that Hindu spiritual experiences are compatible with Christianity. And the incredible thing is that so many Christian leaders through their books, magazines, sermons, radio and TV programs encourage millions of Christians to seek Christianized Hindu experiences. Many people who are in the Christian church have come to us and have had deeper experiences of spirituality and of God as a result of this meditation. As a society, we've become geared to basing our beliefs on our experiences. If our experience and our feelings tell us that something is valid and genuine and good, then we automatically assume that that is the measure of absolute truth. No distinction is made whether this is uh, a spiritual experience coming from uh, God the Father or from the rule of this world. The appreciation of Satan or the devil or demons has diminished enormously because rationality says there cannot be a Satan, cannot be demons. These are psychological phenomena, maybe even have to be treated by a psychiatrist. Opening, therefore, to a spiritual experiences one's soul uh, opens many people to the occult. The Jesus who came to me in times of deep meditation gave me visions and experiences that were beautiful beyond description. I was convinced that because I was witnessing miracles of healing, because these things are so filled with love, they must be good and from God. And yet one day it occurred to me that I had no objective, absolute truth against which to test my experiences, that my feelings, my emotions, perhaps were open and subject to some form of subtle manipulation which I didn't understand. At that point, I decided to look into the Old and New Testament. I knew that I'd fallen then for the Jesus of the counterfeits. Trying to develop spirituality based on feelings, ecstasy or experiences, is like building a house on sand. Our relationship with God should be built on a solid foundation of biblical knowledge. Now, I believe that we are challenged to test the spirit, that we should read scripture, that we should study the Bible, and that we should not value experiences higher than the word of God. Biblical meditation is thinking deeply on the person and work of God and Christ, concentrating on and knowing his word. Most Catholic monasteries and most Protestant Bible schools have introduced one system of meditation or another and they are based upon the practices of yoga many of the church people and particularly leaders of the churches and denominations look with great hope to eastern mysticism that it would bring new life 
into a dead body. I recently graduated from a major American theological seminary and I've seen an alarming influence of Eastern mysticism in terms of using meditation techniques, biofeedback, self-hypnosis, auto-suggestion as a tool in order to gain mental and physical health. The danger to the students is that these professors are using Christian terminology in order to describe Eastern techniques. One of the professors who is teaching Christian meditation told us to empty our minds because we should kind of image God in this meditation. The belief that we can create reality with our minds comes directly from the Hindu concept that everything is an illusion or maya. This is the new delusion in transpersonal psychology and it's rampant even in the evangelical church today where it's becoming increasingly popular to believe that we enhance worship by visualizing an image of God or of Jesus, that we create the answer to our prayers by visualizing what we're praying for. Creating a visual image of Jesus or God in our minds is no less idolatrous than if we made the same image out of wood or stone. Forcing God to participate in a situation or honor a desire that I have visualized in my imagination is simply a devious way of attempting to manipulate him into doing what I want without admitting it. While infiltrating the Christian church, Eastern mysticism is also powerfully influencing world politics. Under the umbrella of the United Nations, countless New Age groups spread their philosophies worldwide. Many UN leaders, UN agencies, and the World Council of Churches with its deep UN ties promote New Age beliefs and practices. The UN has its own meditation room and resident guru, Sri Chinmoy. Even the United States Pentagon has meditation rooms. A graduate of Harvard School of Divinity, Leland Stewart, directs the Unity and Diversity Council, a powerful New Age promotional network that originated with a 1965 directive of the United Nations General Assembly. Unity and Diversity Council is a worldwide coordinating body of what we call it individuals, organizations, and networks looking toward a time in which there will be a one single organized energy of networking throughout the planet. Under Stewart's leadership in 1982, this group linked arms with Graham Wilson's Mind Body Spirit Festivals, forming a vast army dedicated to the merger of all religions into one under a world leader. I am very interested in the harmony of all religions. It's not just to give birth to another religion, but rather to, to produce, let's call it, a universal religious outlook through which there can be a new connecting of all cultures and all religions, all races. In this growing consciousness of sharing godliness and looking for a leader to uh, uh, lead everyone into this a new heaven, the UN plays a very important role in as much as it is a support system. Any group that meets to discuss these matters would be very eager and very careful to have UN sponsorship. Our organization has been represented in the United Nations. We have an office there and this has been going on for approximately five years. We've been involved in all the sessions that are going on in the UN. We've been able to um, watch and participate, offering um, meditations and presentations. How is this possible? I think it became possible by the, the thought and actions of one man in the UN, Robert Mueller, who was continuously emphasizing that the UN has to be a support system to this conditioning of man, to this sharing desire, to this uh, uh, looking for a one world government, for one world leader, and playing down, and I believe myself correctly, that the UN is not that world government. That is a conditioning device, that it is an aid, a support system. It gives prestige to uh, otherwise completely outlandish groups. The Brahma Kumaras World Spiritual University in India is used by the UN and its members for conferences focusing on world peace and unity. 
delegates from all over the world, VIPs, are attending to express their ideas and to experience peace in a very real way themselves. This experience will enable them also to draw up new laws for universal peace. This will be endorsed by heads of state and submitted as a practical um, form for the United Nations. Many evenings, the UN building is even used for lectures, talks, uh, meditations, uh, enlightenments uh, on how to make one better world. The leaders are asked to meditate and be involved because this is part of their instruction, their brainwashing, and all this is part of the conditioning for the vision of a new world or of a new age. This guruistic system in politics is very dangerous for our democratic society. It will at least bring a loss of freedom, a loss of security, and a big danger for all mankind. So I believe guruism is preparing the world for some political fascism too. Actually, we're being prepared for the surrender to an authority in a way that perhaps we don't realize. We are going through right now strange bathing in Eastern concepts of consciousness, states of consciousness, bliss, reincarnation, energies, vibrations, all of these words that have become very commonplace, really, in the, the Western languages, are also modifying our mind. They are changing our way of thinking. And this changed way of thinking puts us into a, a mental state, if you'd like, and prepares our um, intellectual functionings for the surrender. More than ever before, the human race seems willing to surrender spiritually and emotionally to a charismatic leader who can offer peace and prosperity to a world trembling on the brink of ecological and social collapse, international financial chaos, and a nuclear holocaust. Well-known New Ager Benjamin Krem claims to be the coming world leader's advanced public relations man. In 1982, full-page advertisements around the world announced the coming of Krem's New Age Christ, which gave fresh hope to millions. At this press conference in Los Angeles, he described how this Christ would make himself known. It is a truism today to say that we are at the dawn of a new age, the age of Aquarius. And it is important to remember that all of the great religions await the coming of a teacher. The Christians await the return of the Christ. The Muslims await the Imam Mahdi. At the same time, the Buddhists await the coming of another Buddha. The Hindus await the return of Krishna, and the Jews, as always, await the coming of the Messiah. I'm speaking today about the return of such a teacher. Christians are awaiting the return of the resurrected Jesus with the nail prints in his hands and feet. But the followers of the gurus are awaiting a coming world ruler who won't even claim to be Jesus, but the latest reincarnation of the Christ spirit, and he will have the psychic powers to prove it. Simultaneously, throughout the world will take place hundreds of thousands of spontaneous healings and cures, which will reinforce, if that were even necessary, the fact that it is the Christ himself. The Day of Declaration will be the outstanding event of this or any other century. On that day, the radio and the television networks of the world will be linked together. We shall see this extraordinary face on our television screens. But he will not speak. His words will drop silently into our minds in our own language. This is the significance of the altered state of consciousness reached in yoga and other forms of Eastern meditation. A Nobel Prize winner has described the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate, unquote. What that means is, in an altered state of consciousness, the connection between my spirit that normally operates my brain and my brain is loosened, and that allows another spirit being to interpose itself, begin to tick off the neurons in the brain, create an entire universe of illusion, astral travel, give psychic powers. In this way, the world is being prepared for some ultimate delusion. He will indeed inaugurate a great new world religion, and at the very most sacred core, 
of that new world religion will be the process which is called the esoteric initiations which take us out of the strictly human kingdom into the kingdom of God. David Spangler, board member of the Planetary Initiative for the World We Choose, which comes out of the United Nations, declares that Lucifer is the same force as Christ, that Lucifer prepares us for our own Christhood, that this is the final Luciferic initiation into the new age. Benjamin Krems Christ may not be the world teacher and ruler of world peace as he forecasted, but without question, the stage is being set today for what the Bible calls the apostasy or man's abandonment of God. This climate is ushering in the final actor, the counterfeit, who the Bible predicts must come before the return of Jesus, the true Prince of Peace, who will then reign for a thousand years. The merger of science and mysticism is now in full blossom, and its evil fruit will be the new universal religion of the coming world dictator that the Bible identifies as the Antichrist. The consequence of Hindu religion in the form of Guruism in our part of the world will be extraordinary. Everything will be changed, not just our religiosity, but also our concept of man, our democracy, our tradition of humanitarianism and caring for one another, our social systems. All that will become meaningless because it's all based on the Christian presuppositions which will then eventually be lost. We'll get a man-centered, individualistic, egocentric sort of religiosity where salvation means escape from the world, everything which binds us to other human beings, everything which makes us caring and loving creatures. Today's revival of paganism and Hindu practices which form the heart of the New Age movement was ironically the same kind of foundation that prepared the way for Hitler's rise to power. The Germany of the 20s and 30s was in social and economic despair and looked for a leader who would free them from the Great Depression. The man with a promise of hope was Adolf Hitler who claimed he was ordained of God to usher in 1,000 years of peace and prosperity. His hypnotic powers manipulated an entire nation to surrender its collective mind to him. Obsessed with the occult, Hitler drew many of his bizarre ideas from Hinduism. Within Guruism, it's therefore not surprising that we find very positive sentences, very positive stances in relation to Nazism. A number of the gurus have praised Hitler for what he has done, including his killing of six million Jews. He took the symbol of the swastika as his own a Hindu symbol of power seen in many of today's temples in India. Millions of Germans who submitted to Hitler as though he were God died for him and his cause, much like the followers of Jim Jones. The current worldwide revival of Hinduism blended with psychology and disguised as self-improvement, self-hypnosis, positive mental attitude seminars, visualization techniques, and mind dynamics courses has made today's world far more susceptible to spiritual deception than the Germany that embraced Adolf Hitler. Today, a desperate world is looking for another spiritual leader. Has the human race learned nothing from its own mistakes?
Jesus says, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, behold here is the Christ, or there he is. Do not believe them. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Let no one deceive you. The apostasy comes first, then the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me.